Welcome everyone. We'll be talking today about a fascinating subject and giving you an in-depth inside one of the, the most unknown, yes, the most consumed spirit in the world. We envision that this seminar will contribute to a, the, the, the education and the advancement of the global drink industry. I, I do believe personally the spirit category uh, with the amount of possible like the financial support uh, behind them and also the, the desire to extend to a more global audience, we'll be able to give great support to uh, our industry. The same pretty much as like all the other spirits groups that have done it in the past and are doing it today. I'm Bastien Sioka. I'm the corner of uh, Hope and Semi in Guangzhou, in China. We have been running our main uh, cocktail bar for the past five years. Oftentimes we traveled around the world, uh, you know, in search of like the most rare, the most crafted gin, rum or vermouth. In order to, to bring that back to our customers, to make them try and, and, you know, make them discover very interesting spirits. However, in the pandemic time last year, we couldn't travel anymore. And with the team, we asked ourselves a very, you know, very simple question. Why not to explore Baijiu? There is over 10,000 of brands uh, currently in China. And uh, the Baijiu just like the, the Baijiu started thousand years ago. So why we didn't, you know, dig into it before. So today we, we aim to take a deep dive in the world to the world of Baijiu while exploring like all the potential value in our cocktail industry and what movers and shakers are doing to grow the spirit category with China and globally. So today I would like to introduce you our amazing panels. Thanks a lot to everyone from different corners of the country and, and the world for being here. Let me introduce you first, Jacqueline. Hello, I'm Jacqueline. I'm the head bartender of Sanyo. And Sanyo is a modern Chinese cocktail bar in the south of China. And it's located in the super famous restaurant called Wen He Yo. And Wen He Yo covers 50,000 people per day. I love bartending. I have been a bartender uh, over 10 years. And also I have uh, five years old kids and uh, I love coffee. So I drink coffee every day. I found some ideas uh, into my cocktail and my work. And uh, I love cooking to my uh, colleagues and friends. And all the inspiration is from my mom because she is a chef. And I like to traveling around the world to know a lot of the culture, different culture of the each country. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Vincent. I'm based in Chengdu, China. I work for one of China's biggest company called Luzhou Laojiao. And I'm the Baijiu educator, Baijiu technical judge. I work in the Baijiu, Baijiu industry for more than seven years. And I'm also a wine educator for, in the wine industry for more than 10 years. So what I would like to do is to use a different way to introduce Baijiu to different people maybe some kind, kind of international way. So good to know you and good to see you. Great, pleasure to have you today. Jim, do you want to, uh, you want to introduce yourself? Hello everyone, my name is Jim Boyce. I'm based in Beijing. I work mostly in the Chinese grape wine industry, but I started World Baijiu Day in 2015 for fun. We have zero budget. Um, we depend solely on the enthusiasm and the, you know, the generosity of our partners around the world. And I think we've done events now in around 60 cities on six continents. So that's basically just a fun little project we do to kind of introduce more people to Baijiu. My basic thinking is if you're into alcohol and you've never tried Baijiu, it's like being into spaghetti and never trying noodles or being into pop music and never hearing the Beatles. It's just something we want to introduce to people. I'm not an evangelical. I just want people to try it. Great. And, uh... Uh, after you, Derek. Sure. Hi, um, my name is Derek Sandhouse. Um, I would consider myself more on the uh, evangelical spectrum of Baijiu enthusiasm. I um, have written a couple of books about Baijiu, um, Baijiu, The Essential Guide to Chinese Spirits uh, in 2014 and Drunk in China in 2019. And uh, in 2018, I 
uh, co-founded Ming River Sichuan Baijiu, a uh, strong aroma Baijiu uh, with China's oldest continually operating distillery, Lu Zhou Lao Jiao. So um, I've had a lot of experience both, um, you know, promoting and learning about Baijiu within China and trying to like share what I've learned um, overseas, uh, primarily in the US and Europe. So we, we will begin with our first question of today. Where Baijiu is standing uh, right now? And for that, I would, ask, uh, I would like to ask uh, Vincent, how the, the Baijiu market in China is doing? And do you see an increase? Do you see brand like entering the market or any changing trends? Okay. Baijiu is quite a huge market in China. Actually, the sales revenue of Baijiu producer in 2020 is around 583.6 billion Chinese yuan, which is around 90 billion US dollar. Compared to 2019, it had 2.9% increase. Strong aroma, we call it Nongxiang Xin Baijiu in China, is a main style with more than 70% production capacity in the whole industry. You know, the biggest five Chinese Baijiu coming, three of them are Nongxiang Xin Baijiu, which is strong aroma Baijiu. But now something changed, especially the recent three years, source aroma, we call it Jiangxiang Xin Baijiu, become the superstar. We could see that most new Baijiu producer and brand come from the, this kind of aroma style, like some Tong Tai, and new increasing Diao Yu Tai. Of course, thanks to Mao Tai. Mao Tai is the biggest Chinese Baijiu company. I have some data sharing with you. You could say that. In 2020, source aroma about the quantity is only around 8%. But we compare to the other day, the total production is like a small quantity, but the profit of the whole industry, it counts for around 40%. That's why everybody crazy for this kind of source of Roman Baijiu. And now we could see some new trend, new packaging and low alcohol and new culture. Everything's new in China and more Baijiu companies, especially the big company, focus on the new generation, the young generation. We find that old generation prefer to choose Baijiu, but the young generation have a lot of things to choose, wine, whiskey, brandy. So Baijiu are trying to get a new face for the young generations. That is the Baijiu industry now in China. Thank you very much. Like very interesting numbers, how, how big, like some of the super the aroma is taking over. And Jacqueline, for, for you, how, how Baijiu cocktails across the country, how is it doing? Is it rather growing in popularity or is it fading in trends? I think it's blowing up. Throughout these years, uh, the development of Baijiu in the industry is up and down. But now more and more younger bartenders have used to use uh, Baijiu in cocktails. And in 2014, it opened the first Chinese Baijiu cocktail bar in Beijing called Capital uh, Spirits. Unfortunately, it closed now. And uh, in 2017, a female bartender uh, opened a Chinese style uh, cocktail bar in Shanghai. And uh, 2020, last year, we opened Sanyo. Wait, so there's not too many bars around China? Though. Yes, now uh, there are three main uh, Baijiu bars in China. And so the younger generation of bartenders, how do they see Baijiu? Are they interested to make cocktail with or not? Uh, yes, I think they love to try the new things and take this new challenge. Okay, very cool. Thank you. And then to you, Jim Boyce, like uh, you have organized a lot of events over the years. Have you seen any like a change in interest of media or consumers? I think we do see a change in consumer interest in China. Um, I think number one 
is an increasing pride in China. Um, Chinese are prouder of their brands and their achievements. I mean, you look at the space program recently, you look at how they responded to COVID, you look at products like Xiaomi and Huawei, there's an idea now of pride in locally produced products. So I think people are extending that to food and drink, including Baijiu. I don't think it's huge, but I think there is a significant number of young people who are interested in their own products here. Um, the mm -hmm. other thing I think has happened in the past five or six years is experience. I think five or six years ago, we had two Baijiu bars in Beijing. There was one in New York, Liverpool, they're all gone. I think that was kind of a novelty period. People went there just to drink Baijiu. And I think now five years later, a lot of consumers have been to a lot of bars, wine bars, craft beer bars, cocktail bars. They're looking now for more experience. And I think what we see now is Baijiu being incorporated into a general menu. So there's a new bar on my street. They have like 10 housed cocktails and two of them include Baijiu. They're not a Baijiu bar. They're a regular bar where Baijiu is part of the menu now. So I think we're seeing a mat mature maturation of how people see Baijiu in the cocktail scene. Very interesting. Can I just say also, one yeah. of the things that really excited me for World Baijiu Day is we have a Peruvian restaurant called Pachapapi. And it was the last place I expected to find my favorite Baijiu cocktail using the cheapest Erguito. But these guys took a lot of their own syrups and shrubs and blood orange soda and made an amazing cocktail created by a visiting Peruvian bartender named Alexander Hollander. So for World Baijiu Day, we featured this drink in Beijing while he featured it in Lima at the exact same time. And I think this type of thing is kind of evidence of the growing interest in Baijiu and excitement around it. Very, very interesting. Th thanks a lot, Jim. And then that kind of link what Jim said to, to for you direct. From a more like an institutional point of view, have you seen like the interest for Baijiu like changing in the last few years? So like also an increase in, in brands available overseas? Uh, yeah, I, I definitely have seen an increase in interest in Baijiu, uh, not just the last few years, but like over that long trajectory that Jim was talking about, about the last 10 years or so. Um, for example, the first um, Baijiu cocktail that I ever had was also in Beijing. Um, and that was by um, a great bartender, Paul Matthew, who's now in London and soon to be in Iceland. And uh, at the time I'd asked him what the challenges were of, uh, you know, promoting Baijo in a cocktail setting. And he said for him, it was just getting people to try it uh, because a lot of the like local Chinese customers were used to drinking Baijo in a restaurant setting. So the cocktail just didn't like make sense for them as a way to, to drink a Baijo. Um, and for a lot of the foreigners uh, who had like not developed a taste or didn't know a lot about Baijiu, um, they had a lot of skepticism about trying any drink that, that used Baijiu in the cocktail. So um, that was where things were about 10 years ago. But now I think um, internationally, you see a huge interest in like regional uh, spirits, not just, you know, Baijiu, you, like Mezcal was years before Baijo in this process. Um, you see, you know, brandies are having like a, more interest being shown in them. So there's just a growing interest, I think, in more diverse international spirits. And uh, that's, that's like Baijo is going along uh, that general trend. But I, I think the other thing that's changed a lot is that you have um, people who are actually like going to China and trying to like create Baijos that are good representations of the category. Whereas, you know, 10 years ago, most of the Baijo companies that were selling overseas were trying to, you know, clean up Baijo and make it acceptable for an international audience. They would say, you know, like, we don't think that this is suitable for the Western market. So we're going to change it. We're going to filter it. We're going to add flavors to it. But uh, what you're seeing right now is a lot more self-confident. It's people who are saying, I, I like Baijo, I believe it is a good drink, and here is a good one for you to try. And, and that's, that's a huge attitudinal difference than, than where it was a decade ago. Okay, thanks a lot. And then after that, we'll move to a, a very important question for uh, Jacqueline and Vincent. 
is, is a question very basic, like why should we focus on Baijiu? So Jacqueline, share with, the, with us your experience to make cocktail with Baijiu. And what have you learned from opening Sanyo with a sole focus on Baijiu cocktails? Okay, before the Sanyo project, I knew a little about the Baijiu, uh, like some well-known Chinese brand, Mao Tai, Lu Zhou Lao Jiao, or Hen Zhou. But Mao Tai and uh, Lu Zhou Lao Jiao also have a complex and big flavor. So after Sanyo project, uh, I discovered many interesting aromas of Baijiu. But I studied from uh, Mao Tai and Lu Zhou Lao Jiao because most of the Chinese people or young generation know them. We have to move, uh, we use the many uh, techniques uh, into the cocktails like the distillation, clarification, and uh, fermentation, and sous vide. And in cocktails, in Sanyo, we have two new parts, very popular. Uh, one is from the compares Mao Tai to the dark chocolate, cherry, and the red pepper bitter. And the one is from Lu Zhou Lao Zhao, compares, compares to the mango, uh, fig, and the orange, and uh, some white chocolates. So when the customers come to Sanyo first, I introduce them this to new punch. And uh, this tasty cocktail, they will love to try more Baijiu cocktails. And uh, many interest, interesting uh, aromas uh, like the Sipong from the, the south, from the north of China. Uh, it has a lot of the tropical food like passion fruit, mango flavors, and uh, also almond flavors. So for me, it very works well uh, to the picky cocktails. And uh, like the Lao Bai Gan from Hebei, its uh, alcohol has very high like uh, they have 76% uh, uh, of alcohol, yeah, overproof. And it is very refreshing, but it's very refreshing and uh, clean, it's similar to the vodka. And also, and uh, I found that the uh, uh, Yuping Shao from my hometown, it used the pork fat wash into the rice wine. And in China, fat wa pork fat wash has uh, over 700 years history. So it's surprising. And the other very interesting, the special aroma is the sesame aroma. Wow, very tasty. Yeah, uh, it's very special. It doesn't has any uh, sesame ingredients into, in the baijiu, but you can taste very strong sesame and nutty flavor in it. And uh, I compare it to the coconut and the lime. We can do a very tasty sour drink. So yeah, this uh, cocktails is uh, our Sanyo make. Mm -hmm. Thanks. A lot of inspiration, a lot of ingredients to, to actually uh, play with Baijiu. And in a non other angle, because we talk a lot about flavors right now, uh, Vincent, how the Baijiu category could be compared, for example, like to, to different style of whiskey, you know, talking about mm -hmm. like, uh, Scotch and Irish whiskeys. Okay, just like we mentioned, there's a lot of Roman styles in China, more than 30. But there are 12 main categories, four basic categories, Nong, Jiang, Qin, Li, which also call strong aroma, sauce aroma, light aroma, and rice aroma. And we have eight other aroma styles, but they are all evolved from the four basic such as mixed aroma, jian xiang xin. It's uh, like a kind of mixed with uh, strong aroma and sauce aroma. That's why we could taste in this kind of baijiu with both flavors from strong aroma and flavors from sauce aroma. And we also mentioned about that, shi xiang xin, shi. They use pig fat adding in the rice aroma baijiu to give it more texture, to give it more body and more flavor. So that makes it a special style. Actually, unique production technique gives the baijiu different flavors. For example, we could use rice, sorghum, wheat, corn, different materials due to the fermentation. And we could also use different fermentation vessels. 
we could use clay, we could use stone, we could use pottery vessels, the traditional Chinese pottery vessel, and we could use stainless steel that all gives different flavors. And about the fermentation and the distillation, we use different qi. Qi is used to do the fermentation and it could also add different flavors. We had big qi, small qi, full qi, and qi bing. So that's everything makes the unique. As a result, we could find the strong aroma by Zhou, like Lu Zhou Jiao and Wu Liang Ye with distinct pineapple flavor. It's a key, should have pineapple flavor and also passing food and with some fennel like that. For the sauce aroma, we know, we all know that Multi, the biggest spider company in China, the character is about the sauce aromas, like some soy sauce or some kind of sweet traditional Chinese sauce. If you have tried the Beijing dark, you may know what I mean. Uh, what is interesting, we have light aroma. Light aroma is more pure and clean with apricot and some stony food flavors. I would like to compare the Baijiu with wines. For me, the sauce aroma Baijiu is like a Napa Cabernet, strong and with a lot of flavor. The strong aroma Baijiu is like the Bordeaux red and the light aroma Baijiu like uh, Burgundy or Pinot Noir. If I say like this, you may understand more. Yeah. So that's very, that's very interesting. Honestly, what you said, like that was the, my most sort of like impressive uh, feeling when I really discovered Baijiu. It was like mm -hmm. the, the range of flavors from one to the other was just amazing. It was, I, I never expected to, to see how like that much versatility. Thanks a lot. And then there is a, always like a big question that goes when you talk about Baijiu and, and the global cocktail scene. The question is like, will Baijiu will ever become uh, a significant kind of spirits in the global scene? So Jim Boys, some of the like uh, larger Baijiu brand, they're already exporting to many countries. Uh, some of the Baijiu they even produced in different parts of the world, like you shared with me. You, you founded World Baijiu Day six years ago now. Like, and how do you see like this international community growing? So I read a lot of the media coverage of Baijiu and it seems like Baijiu has been the next big thing for 10 years. It's really the longest coming out party in history. Um, I'm not that confident it's gonna be mainstream. Um, I think we had a novelty period five years ago. We had that bar in New York, Liverpool, uh, two bars in Beijing, as I mentioned, they're all closed. There was a cocktail week, a Baijiu cocktail week in London for three years, it's gone. As far as I know, World Baijiu Day, which has zero budget, is the longest running Baijiu event in the world right now, which is not a great sign. I'm happy about it, but I mean, it's not a great sign. Um, but I think the, the positive is the people who are still doing Baijiu are true to it now. The novelty is gone. It's people who are really interested in it and are exploring it for all of its diversity. So I do think it's going to be a very slow process. Um, the big issue for me is these big companies, what are their true intentions? I'm not 100% convinced they really want to go overseas as much as they say. I think a lot of it is um, talk for shareholders. Um, it's a good story going overseas, but I meet these guys in Beijing and a lot of them tell me after we talk about cocktails and all these things, they're like, how do I buy an ad in the New York Times? I mean, they want some risk-free promotion. That's what they want. They want a billboard or they want to sponsor an event or um, they want to buy an ad in a newspaper. So I think it's really going to have to come from ground level, not from the media, not from kind of these big projects, but from individual bartenders and enthusiasts around the world. And that's one thing that keeps me going. Um, I, I call what I'm doing, making Baijiu discoverable. So we don't know when it's going to become more popular, but we have to be ready when that happens. So last week I went to a Greek wine dinner. I've been in wine for 12 years and I finally got interested in Greek wine variety, grape varieties last week. And I went online and all this information was available. 
So right now we're accumulating books and websites and cocktail recipes for people in the future when they do get interested. That's what's important about what's happening right now. And if I can just think outside of the box for just a couple of minutes, what could make Baijiu more popular? I mean, just the rise of China alone is going to make people interested in Chinese culture, Chinese food, Chinese drinks. That alone will drive interest in Baijiu. Um, an overseas Baijiu may catch on fire. Look at Japanese whiskey. If you told people 50 years ago, Japanese whiskey or Australian wine would be popular, people would think you're crazy, but it happens. Um, it may happen outside of Europe and North America. We always assume these trends will happen in Europe and North America. Sorghum's from Africa, it's a great story. There's growing middle classes in South America, Europe, across Asia that could, they could be the guys who put Baijiu on the world map, not Europe and North America, we don't know. Um, I'm always reading these things in China about how healthy Baijiu is. I'm not sure all these microbes, but what if that became something that was very conscious in society that could drive sales. And the last one is, uh, I would say like TV and movies. You can't underestimate the power of a good movie or a good TV. It could be an action hero that does a shot of Baijiu before he goes out and gets the bad guys. I don't know. I work in Chinese wine and we've tried everything. We've hired master wines, master sommeliers, we've done tours. The number one thing that propelled Chinese wine this year was a TV show about poverty eradication. It's about 20 years of poverty eradication in the Ningxia region. People love it. And the last episode, they drink wine made in that region. So we, I, I wanna say there's, I, I don't wanna be a pessimist. I think it's gonna be very tough to make Baijiu um, mainstream, but I think there's a lot of things we just don't know that could happen. So, so we may uh, need James Bond to drink a uh, Baijiu Martini in the next movie. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, thanks a lot. There is one uh, very important point when, when I was uh, discussing with Derek about a lot of like, you know, approach and, and points. And something that was very interesting was like, Derek, tell us a bit how COVID-19 have changed the Baidu industry and the, the internationalization of the industry. Sure. Well, I, I think one one point I would like to make is that I, I'm personally like a bit more optimistic about where Baijiu is headed because like, yes, it's true. Like it has been recorded as a growing trend for five, 10 years uh, around the world. And the, the main reason I see that as someone like operating outside of China is because it is in fact growing. Um, you, you know, could find Baijiu, um, as Jim mentioned, in about four bars 10 years ago, you can find Baijiu in hundreds of bars and restaurants today. So like the, the rate of accelerated growth that you're seeing with this category is noteworthy. And it's also important to look at like the spirits that preceded it. So um, when you look at drinks, you know, vodka um, 100 years ago, was not an international drink. It was not widely consumed. Uh, mezcal, tequila, uh, 30, 40 years ago were not incredibly popular drinks uh, like they are today. What, what you're seeing is that these, these trends in order for something to go from relative obscurity to the mainstream takes decades. But like the, the initial progress that we're seeing to get there with Baijiu uh, is very encouraging. I think it could get there much faster than these, drink, these other drinks have. Um, so I have um, kind of uh, wound myself up. Could you remind me what the question was? Yeah, it was just to kind of to see how, like recently with what happened with COVID-19, how did you see sort of the development yeah, sure. of Baijiu? Sure. So COVID-19, um, in terms of the internationalization of Baijiu, I think has been very challenging um, for, for a couple of reasons. One is obviously because um, a lot of the initial reports were out of, uh, you know, coming out of China. And so it's like created uh, a lot of skepticism about things coming out of China. Um, that, that was initially an issue, but I I don't really see a lot of overlap between like anti-Chinese xenophobia and people who would go out to a bar and order a Baijiu cocktail in the first place. They're just, you know, in different universes. 
Um, but uh, the, the thing that is has me the most worried um, about this period is I think you were seeing a lot of international development. You were seeing a lot of um, both, you know, you know, international companies that were going in China and trying to invest in the Baijiu industry. And you were also seeing a lot of Chinese uh, producers of Baijiu who were looking to export their products outside of China and um, market to a more mainstream international audience. And all of those efforts have just been put on pause because China has been pretty much closed to foreign travel uh, for over a year now. And it's unclear when it's going to open back up. So um, any of the plans that were currently in development at the beginning of 2020 um, have been delayed who knows how long. Uh, some of them might never come about because of this. So um, it, it, I think, could be a little bit of a setback. And, and hopefully China will be back open. Hopefully, uh, you know, this pandemic will be brought under control in, in our near future. But uh, in, until that happens, it's going to be challenging to build upon the momentum that we were seeing uh, just a couple of years ago. I see. Very interesting. The, um, that was one point when we were discussing, let's say in a very optimistic way, Baijiu do get more and more attraction and, and grow in the world. There's a, an interesting question uh, that we talked together is, and it's very basic, but it's very important. On the shelf in a liquor store, where, where would you actually put a bottle of Baijiu uh, well, next to which category or, or how you, would you define it next to a tequila or, or you know, how you use it? Well, it's, it's a really important question, and it's one that directly builds on the question that we were just talking about. One of the reasons that um, it's currently challenging to sell Baijiu outside of China, um, particularly at like a normal like neighborhood liquor store, is because there aren't more Baijiu brands. And the faster there can be more Baijiu brands in the market, uh, the better it's going to be for everyone who's interested in Baijiu and selling Baijiu. Um, because right now, when I walk into a liquor store and I want them to purchase Baijiu, um, the question that they'll often say is like, yes, sure, I'll take this Baijiu, but where, where on my shelf do I put it? Should I put it next to the vodka because it's a white spirit? Do I put it next to the sake because it comes from Asia? And the answer is often neither of those places. So like, for example, um, as uh, Jack and Vincent have been talking about, Baijiu is a hugely diverse category of spirits and each one of these categories of Baijiu tastes pretty different. So like a strong aroma Baijiu, which has a lot of like funky high ester, like pineapple notes, that's something you might put next to like rum agricole or like a pot distilled Jamaican rum, which is also sweet and funky. Um, a light aroma baijo, which tends to be dry and crisp and has like kind of like apricot dried fruit like sweetness. That's something I would put on a shelf next to a grappa, uh, like a, a rice aroma baijo, which is really mild. Like that is something you might put next to, um, you know, a vodka or a shochu or, or something else that's very like mild and has like a bit of graininess to it. So, um, the, the answer is the different Baijos go in different places, but the easiest way to get around this problem is to have more Baijo brands so you can actually create a Baijo section at the liquor store. It's a very good point. It's very complex to, to, to decide where and, and how to put it. And then if, if in a very short sentence, for example, like with Ming River, how would you say why it would be very important for every bar back to have Baijiu? Well, I, I don't know that it is important for every bar back. Um, I, like, apologies to my business partners. It's not important for every bar back to work with Ming River, but it's important for Ming River to be available in the places where it's going to succeed. Um, so like at your neighborhood sports bar where people are doing Jaeger bombs, like, they don't probably need to have Baijiu anytime soon, but like uh, at like a high high end craft mixology bar at a tiki bar, places where 
they're putting a lot of thought into what products they're selecting and they're looking for different, uh, every bottle behind the bar to bring a little something different from the other bottles. Um, you get flavors in the Baijiu category that you just won't find in other international spirits, um, particularly umami flavors. So if you're looking to expand the horizons of your customers, if you're trying to have combinations of flavors that you can't get from other drinks, like, yes, it's very important to be working with Baijiu. Um, the other obvious place for Baijiu um, and where we've had a lot of success in the market is in um, kind of like mid to high end um, Chinese and Asian restaurants more broadly um, that are working with a craft cocktail problem or program because many of these places are working with vodka and gin and whiskey based cocktails, even, even like mezcal, brandy, uh, the, the common international spirits. Uh, but those spirits, don't really come from the same flavor universe as as, as Baijiu does. You know, as I, as I mentioned before, Baijiu is always served with food in China, and the flavors of Chinese food are highly complementary to regional Chinese uh, spirits. So, at a Sichuan restaurant, the flavors of a strong aroma Baijiu pair perfectly. So, if if you're working with uh, you know, whiskey and gin, like sure you can make drinks that are going to pair with the food, but they won't pair as well as a Baijiu drink does. I have to, uh, to take to that uh, on that, that I, I got very surprised when we started to go to restaurants and be like, oh, we are now in Chengdu. Let's order a local Baijiu with the food. And at first you have no choice. <laughs> it's like people in Baijiu and then they bring Baijiu on the table. But as uh, my time in China, like, more and more now we're going to a restaurant it's like no no let's have uh baijiu from the region where the food come from and mm -hmm. i have I have to say what you say is like the pairing is very very good uh, so it makes a lot of sense it, uh, it just, the, the flavors developed over time together so like the taste the local taste what appeals to this the same people they're looking for the same tastes in the food as they are in the drink so um, it's, it's a general rule of thumb. If you know where a style of Baijiu comes from on the map, the food from that region is almost certainly going to pair pretty well with that Baijiu. Which is uh, very similar from like wine. If you have wine in France, if it's like a, a rosé from Provence, or if it's like a Pinot Noir, the food also match really very well together. So it makes a lot of sense. And Jim Boyce, for you, a question, like could you share with us some of the creative idea that you have done with Baijiu? that generate like curiosity toward like more like the uh, you know, novice consumers and, and help them to, to get familiar with the, the flavors of Baijiu. So we have kind of two types of people show up at our events. And I, I speak mostly of the events I've done personally. Those are people who know Baijiu and most of them don't really like it that much. And those who don't really know anything about Baijiu. So for my Chinese friends, I make this little infusion. It's a candy called White Rabbit. Everyone loves White Rabbit. I can get anyone who hates Baijiu to drink at least one shot of this. And then I can usually encourage them to try the Fenjo, which I put with this straight. So it's a, just a good way to, I wanna use other products to get them to try it straight. So we do um, deep fried Baijiu. With deep fried Baijiu, you take sponge cake, you pour Baijiu all over it, you put it in the fryer and it gets very crispy on the outside. And we roll it in icing sugar and put blueberry on it. Then you, you serve it with a shot of the Baijiu. So the idea is like, get something very fun and friendly to bridge to the Baijiu. And we've done ice cream. Um, our partner, Lou Big Saf in Stockholm does three gelatos every World Baijiu Day. He has a chain of gelato shops that does a strong aroma, a light aroma, and a soft aroma. It's a fantastic project. We've done coffee and chocolate. A lot of those um, umami flavors from um, sauce aroma go very well with coffee. Bastion, you and I tried one in Beijing a few weeks ago, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've done gummy bears, jello shots, pizza with sauteed, um, baijiu sauteed seafood on top. Wait, so wait, our wait. whole idea is to, <laughs> to have fun. Yeah. I work in Chinese wine and I can tell you, I see some similarities to wine in China and baijiu overseas. Um, in China, 
we're a top 10 wine education market for our top three wine education market for almost a decade. Chinese wines are winning tons of awards. People have disposable income and wine sales are going down. How is this possible? Because it's not fun. I'm sorry, but education has a certain place, but it's so dominant in wine right now, it's really um, kind of crushing the enthusiasm and the fun that most people have towards alcohol. Most people work 60 hours a week. They wanna come out and have fun. So that's my focus. Other people can educate and do stuff, but I wanna give them jello shots and a cocktail. That's what my little niche will be. Mm -hmm. And if they go on, if they suddenly say, wow, you know, this is my first good Baiju experience. Maybe I'll go and try something straight or I'll buy a bottle. That's a victory for me. But if I have to use a jello shot to get there, I'm happy to do it. Okay. Come back. <laughs> and Jacqueline, a little bit the same question for you. What sort of like uh, creative idea have you done uh, in Sanyo? Well, in Sanyo, we have a welcome uh, experience, very special experience for every customer. We will present a welcome box uh, with a very low ABV uh, welcome drink with Baijiu and uh, some eatable rice paper. Pinky with uh, by, a small budget of knowledge on it and uh, welcome snacks uh, made with the leftover of the making cocktails. And after the box, after the experience, the customer will be very excited to try the budget cocktails. And also, we have the 12 different multi sensory cocktails on our menu. So, how does it work? Is it like, like each aroma have different cocktails? represent like it's by Joe or yes our first menu is a uh, child aroma and the child uh, signature plus plus of by Joe hotel mm -hmm. okay thanks a, a question quite important that uh, we've been discussing with some of the panel was like for, for you Jacqueline do you think is it important for by Joe companies here in China if they want to become like a global brand do they need to, to succeed in the, the younger local Chinese consumers? And, and what's your take on that? Uh, yes, uh, it's very important. If the brands want to really succeed, they really need to understand the young drinkers, like the Sanyo customers. And the way a lot of life and habits in our generation is a lot of closer to many populations across the world. That's true, that's something that I've, I've been living for a couple of years in China. And you do see like there's a very, you know, big gaps in a different age of the population. The younger generation are like very open-minded or very intentional compared to a slightly older generations. Yeah, makes sense. And for, for you, uh, Vincent, one, uh, one thought that we're discussing with Derek, and that was a really good point is, uh, and you, you kind of mentioned about it a bit before. A lot of people like mm -hmm. uh, apologize when, when it comes to Baijiu. A lot of uh, people spend a lot of energy uh, explaining how Baijiu could be improved for international palettes. And not too many people dare to, or, or are like self-confident that Baijiu is simply a great spirit on his own, on his own term. And, is worthy to respect as any other spirits, be it uh, a very strong agricultural rum or like a very smoky mezcal or like a really bitter amaro. What do you think about this way of? Mm, okay, uh, I know that and I really understand that, but I have to say it is not necessary to apologize for Baijiu because there is no so called international party at all. If it's real, that should be a virus because people's palate is different and changing. For example, in the wine industry, what is the intellectual palate? If it's 100 years ago, sweetness is a key. You could say Egon Müller, sweet Germany Riesling, so popular. 30 years ago, new French flavor means quality, such to Robert Parker. But now, what about now? Dry style, pure, easy style, like the popular Italian Pinot Grigio. 
and also Asia, European, Latin American, different cultural background gives different party preference. As you see, diversity is the international party. For Baijiu, it's simply a brief spirit, just like you said, on its own terms, and it works with back. I know. Some people will say that I don't like Baijiu, but some people will say, oh, I like it. What we need to do, it's okay. Don't like it, some don't like it. What we need to do is to let more people know that, try that. It is full of interest. It makes uh, the diversity, it makes the uh, spirit industry so interesting and pretty. I choose to do the Baijiu education. It's a way to let more people accept the Baijiu, use different way to try Baijiu. So it works something. For bartenders, for cocktail, I think bartender is one of the worst, greatest work. The cocktail is not only about flavor mixing, but also about culture fusing. So if you want to do the Baijiu industry, we want to promote Baijiu, we need you, we need the bartenders. That's what I want to see. Thanks a lot, that's a very, very good answer. Now it's like for, for now, like pretty much we covered like all the, the point I wanted to do with you. We have a few minutes left. I don't know if there's anything that you want to add uh, or you think we covered everything well. Well, for me, the, the thing I love most about World by Joe Day, it's a lot of work, costs money, but I like the feeling of the connection around the world of all these, I call them enthusiasts because it's more than money for the people we work with. You know, one of the funny things that happened was I was sitting at home and a guy was in Reykjavik, Iceland, a guy from Shanghai. And he sent me a picture saying, I just found a Baijo in Reykjavik. Sent me the back label. I immediately emailed the guy. And he said, how do you know about this? We only put it in that liquor store two days ago. And this is the world we live in where enthusiasts can be in contact and build something up. And I hope, I hope eventually, and like I said, my whole thing about is about making it discoverable. When someone, I didn't always like Baijo. I used to, you know, I used to do the Ganbei dinners and it took me a long time to get to like it. So other people are on that path and we need to make sure when they hit that point where they're interested that there's books and websites and recipes and things for them to discover. What about you, Derek? Oh, yeah, I completely agree with Jim. Uh, I think one of the things that is important for Baijo's future is to make it discoverable. And a big part of that is making sure it gets in the hands of the people who um, are influential in the alcohol world. So I spend most of my time trying to develop resources and assets, whether it's like online Baijo education courses, whether it's cocktail books, whether it's going out and doing events like seminars at Tales of the Cocktail, where you're going to make connections with people who encounter, you know, 50, 100 different drinkers every single day. And if those people can get excited about Baijo, if they can start, um, championing, championing this as something that's exciting, something that's an important part of the international like spirits world, maybe they, they can reach a lot more people than, than I can. So I think the more uh, you're going out there, you're making both the world friendlier for Baijo, but you're also making sure Baijo gets in the hands of the people who can you know pass that message on to other people. Uh, the faster it will get to where we want it to be. That's a good point for all the, the bartenders curious about experimenting with new things around the world. Vincent, do you have something else to kind of like add for, for today's? Uh, for me, I just pick my opinion. Education is the key compared to wine. When the wine just, I mean, the French wine, American wine, Germany wine just comes into the China market, people just think, what is that? It's quite high acidity, less flavor compared to the traditional drink like Baijiu. Nobody likes it. But 20 years after that, we do the WCT, we do the Argentina, New Zealand, French wine, Bordeaux, Burgundian wine education. 
people find that, oh, it's interesting. It's a new world. We find a new world. For Baijiu, we also have a new world for the foreign peoples. So what we need to do is to introduce the new world to them. How to reach that education? That is what I wanted to say. Perfect. Thanks a lot. And Jacqueline, I don't know if you have anything to add. Uh, for me, I hope uh, one day after the COVID-19, when we can travel overseas, uh, I can see more and more about and they use Baijiu in the cultures to, uh, to uh, explore this world. And one, one day, maybe Chinese Baijiu can be one of the main house spirits in the cocktail bar. Big task ahead. <laughs> yeah. right, I, I would like to thank everyone today. Uh, that's been a very, very interesting session. And then I, I learned a lot in the process uh, from reaching to, to all of you and, and to, to talk with all of you. Uh, I think for a lot of people that didn't really know Baijiu or didn't really put too much attention into it, it's something very random, uh, very, you know, it's, it's hard to understand what to do with it. That was our case in our bar for many years. We had a few bottles here and there, and there was never really an attraction to it. But I think once you kind of like get curious about the, the distillation process, the, the, I kind of would say, this is really, if there's one spirit in the world that is crafted, I think Baijo is the crafted spirit. Uh, so I think I encourage every one of you to, to dig down, to search for information. Uh, we're putting now a list, like a PDF with a lot of like Baijo available overseas in different country. And as well, it's kind of like a recap of today's session with a lot of bullet points, a lot of like uh, important messages from, from all our, our panelists. So thanks a lot, everybody. And then uh, thanks to you know, Jack Wayne, Vincent, Jim Boyce, and, and Derek Sennhauser for today's uh, sharings.